and they would also benefit from a Winsend community fund, which we then incentivize going back into the community and with local people deciding how they want to spend the money. So while we've been kind of so we're, we're just an income stream for courses. We, we looked at, um, we initially started off with looking at group size, you know, technical feasibility, what technology is suitable, um, looking at the income stream, so we did a detailed business planning. Student tags are the main key element that made these projects viable, really. On the other hand, you know, the government uh, and their fluctuations with the student tag also kind of we almost kind of relayed the project starting and, and making it happen, and I know that many projects across London and, and the UK really have been affected by uh, changes in the student tariff. Um, but what was really important for our model was that community fund and about forming it into what does it mean for local people, what does it mean for residents in the estate, how are they going to benefit. Um, we brought in a lot of the training, work experience and internships uh, for young people in the estate, for you know, uh, um, local people. Um, that's how how the government structure works. Well, to, to, to develop and deliver a community energy project, it takes a lot. When we started our first project in, in Brixton, it took us at least a year to get the project from concept to, to delivery. And there was so much involved, and I don't think when we started, we kind of fully understood what was in all the different layers that were, were involved. But, you know, that was our journey, and we did it the first time, but, you know, now we've done it a couple of times, and we've got three projects um, and it, we know what, what's needed to be done. Having said that, each community is very different and you know, each project has its own little subtle nuances that you have to deal with. But pretty much we, we kind of narrow down what we have to do. And it, you know, really it's on site, site identification, you know, looking at feasibility, business planning, financial models, um, getting funding to be able to resource it. A lot of what we did in our first project was uh, largely volunteer led. We have thousands of volunteer, volunteer hours go into it. At that time, I was working for Lambeth Council, and you know, to my time, was full time um, support from, from Lambeth Council. Um, you know, there's a lot of legal matters that need to be addressed. You know, we can install the panels on the roof, we don't own the building, so what we did was uh, work in social housing blocks. Um, the estate we worked on was Leicester Estate in Brixton. Um, and they, you know, it was owned by Lambeth Council, so we had to kind of understand what does the lease agreement look like, you know, how do we supply energy, how do you make your vision a reality, really. And there's a lot of accounting, there's a lot of kind of negotiations with the energy providers, you know, metering, you know, procurement, who's going to install the solar panels, what's going to be the price, a lot. But the good thing is that at Green Town in London have done it a couple of times, we're here now be able to share our experience and the knowledge that we've gained with other local community groups across London. So now we're mentoring at least five community, community groups. Um, well, what's that one mentor? I, I think what we're here about today is, uh, is understanding how you reach um, ha how you reach out to people in local communities, how you engage with people, how you take it to from simple consultation to engagement to empowerment to co-production. A lot of what we do is co-production, and um, you know it's about everyone working together with a shared common vision. You know, we start off our projects, uh, you know, with standard consultation techniques, and um, we do a lot of door knocking. We do a we run a lot of events to find out um, what what are the all what is their infrastructure in place already? Because a lot of communities have networks, have have ongoing activities and groups to maintain finding out who they are, where they are, and how to get involved, really. Uh, when I say who, it, you know, it, before any project, uh, it's really to start finding out who's your target audience, who you're working with, what are the needs, what are the priorities, um, what are the shared values, you know, and uh, who's out there, what networks exist. As I said, we, we were really fortunate when we started, we had Transition Town Brixton in the Brixton area, which is a really strong and rich group of people. But um, a lot of people say, well, that's really the same as same old. But um, that's not true. I think every every individual group has a real sense of purpose. purpose. While you've got your active, engaged people, they're often, they're like gold dust because they help reach out to more other people in, in the community. The word is round, peer to peer. That's the kind of approach that really works. 
Um, what all we did, we did a lot of door knocking, you know, a lot of people living in the local uh, estates didn't really want to have time to, to come out to events and a lot of times, you know, you, you, sit, you send in a hand and leave it through the door, um, you know, it's not there. And I think it's about having, in terms of outreach, it's about having a mixed uh, approach. You know, you lose the standard flyers and, and leaflets and newsletters, but I think the people approach is really important and it's about finding out uh, who they are. And, and, and your knock is, is a great way of engaging with people and, and talking to them, having a conversation. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll often we don't be kept as many people, but what we did was we, we re-ran door knocking exercises at different times in the day, in the week, you know, and, and a lot of volunteer time, local people got involved in doing that. So it kind of created a bit of a cycle there where um, once we started door knocking, told people about what we were doing and understood, um, and they understood what we were talking about, they were like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested in this. We got them involved to do the door knocking for us as, along with us as well. Is, is there, it, it, it gives a different message, it's a different kind of, um, there's a different kind of power uh, attached to it when local people living in their own estates, own lots, go out there talking to their own friends and neighbours. Uh, and, and that's what really helped in, uh, in identifying uh, more people, it helped in, in taking ownership and people being more involved, really. Um, why do we do all of this? And you know, it's, it's all really very intensive. And, and I don't think a lot of times funding, funding bodies and organisations and policy makers don't really understand what's involved in getting people involved, what, what's involved in, in, in like, you know, building the base for uh, trust and, and you know, community groups coming together. Um, and it's about being inclusive as well, you know, it's about including everybody. Um, I think this exercise really helps us um, kind of tone our message mm. and, uh, and our communication because it's about making it more relevant. Um, you know, it, when, we, when we go around door knocking, you know, we don't say, oh, we hear about um, tackling, uh, you know, food poverty and uh, addressing climate change. It's not the message because that's not what's relevant or important to who we're talking to, really. It's about, it's about saving money on the energy bills. It's about, um, you know, yes, installing solar panels. It's, you know, it's about training work experience. You know, somebody who would be interested in, um, in a work experience or, you know, paid internships. And those are the kind of points that actually came, that came across and got people more engaged, more involved. So that's a lot about consultation. We, you know, we had a lot of engagement, so you know, taking it from from just talking to people, finding out what they want to do, to kind of having practical um, activities or on the estate, you know, running solar panels, making, making workshops, which are absolutely brilliant. The main tool to get people involved. Um, and I suppose a lot of people in London or England to basically say solar panels, you know, is it really going to generate renewable, you know, energy? And we're like, yes, it is. Uh, it, it will. And, and you know, the, the solar panel making workshops are brilliant. It helps bring a lot of uh, you know young people, old people, different you know members of the community together, uh, and really excited about solar panels. So running intergenerational activities, making it really practical. Um, you know, we did uh, draft proofing. Um, train, train the young people on the estates um, <coughs> about you know what is energy efficiency, what does it mean, what does your how do you understand your 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 bills, your energy bills, um, um, and you know just giving them practical tools. Uh, the activities that we ran were also benefit to them, obviously. You know, um, draft proofing and you know insulating their homes, putting metal you know uh, brushes for their letter yes, boxes. You know, making it practical, making it relevant. Really After you've done your consultation, you've got people involved, you've got activities, you've got a ready group going, you slowly get the you know formation of your of your group and uh, group of people who are meeting on a regular basis. What we found was um, it was really kind of important to have a inclusive um, process where we you know we ran weekly meetings on the estates and it was just an open meeting where anyone could come in, stop in, join the meeting, or you know can leave. And they, um, you know, everyone was kind of involved in the whole process. So we had a set group of people from the start to the finish. But then they also allowed for others who probably didn't have time to give, you know, uh, on a weekly basis, but they wanted to find out about it, wanted to get involved. Um, and, and those are the places where we were on the estate, on a you know, in a particular place, on a regular basis. That constant presence really helped. Presence on the estate really helped get people involved. Um, 
Um, but it's also about agreeing with that in rules uh, and principles. You know, you can often have meetings and people have the strongest uh, voice and um, generally quite, you know, uh, strongly opinionated. They're the ones who tend to dominate the meetings. But I think well, it's about setting setting up the principles from early on as many, you know, um, uh, rules that align for everyone else to participate and making sure that, uh, that everyone's voice is heard. Um, and so I, I think at that stage it's quite important to have a, a good chair or facilitator, you know, within within the group who, who ensures that you know you're actually listening um, to what everyone is saying and every voice is included. And you know, agreeing by consensus. I used to think, um, gosh, that's going to be a really difficult with a group of people. But it's just amazing sitting in some of these meetings and just seeing how um, you know a group of people can come together and kind of, by mutual respect, kind of come, come to an understanding, a shared common understanding, really. And it's about being, you know, tactical, being respectful, um, and, and being able to kind of understand each other's point of views, really. Um, and I think it's, it's, sometimes I sit there and I'm like, this is amazing, you know, this democratic process works. Um, and it's been brilliant when it does. Um, and often, you know, I, I think having large groups of people, small groups of people, you know, it, it, it works out in the end where where everyone has a say and agreement. One of the key elements of our programs is, is running training and work experience. And as I said, for, for a lot of the communities that we work in, it's about not only about the solar panels creating resilience by energy security, but it's also about local people, local jobs. And, uh, you know, working with a lot of young people um, is, is quite crucial in terms of building skills for future generations. Um, we've, um, we've had a lot of people kind of come through uh, with by, you know, the local, the mums of the estate coming and saying, well, I want so-and-so and so-and-so to, to, join, to join the team, and, you know, then dragging them out, making sure that they come on time. And there are a lot of, uh, again, a lot of teething issues, um, you know, working with young people, and obviously their priorities are different, and, and they need a lot of uh, Incentive, but you know, what, once you get there, and when you're working with their mums and you're working with the, with, with the, you know, respected uh, community leaders, you know, they often help to get them to toe the line. Um, and you know, we've we've gone from where on our first project we actually worked with one person um, who was an electrical engineer, and, and he benefited from work experience. And then our third project, we had a team of ten people, ten young people. Uh, who, who went through the internship with us, and it was for fif you know, 10 weeks, 15 weeks, and they actually kept coming again and again because they were involved. And uh, young people actually came out doing the door knocking with us, they, uh, they helped us organize events, they spoke at events, and you know, that's when you're taking it to the next level where you've got ownership, you've got control, uh, and you've got you know, people feeling involved and participating. A lot of uh, Kamal, after his work experience, he, he got headhunted and he's working for Cross Rail. Um, you know, some of them were, were in school and you know they, they, they felt confident, they built that they learned skills and they went on to uh, I think join self and become kind of you know, take on more active roles uh, in, in what they were doing. So I, I think there were some really good stories uh, from that. Not everyone is interested in the technology of solar panels. And I think that's the beauty about our, about our community energy projects. Because, uh, you, you, you know, you, it's about events, it's about management, it's about kind of people, it's about interaction. There's a lot more involved, you know, financial, IT, legal, technical. So uh, giving, that, giving not only the young people, but even residents getting involved in the different elements, everyone felt like they had a role. And, uh, you know, just because they didn't have the technical expertise didn't mean that they couldn't be involved. And I think that was really great in, in bringing people together. Um, this, this is more of a slide to say, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's always a core group of people that you'll be working with uh, and who, who, who might be the ones that are more actively involved on a day-to-day -day basis. So that doesn't mean that you aren't reaching out to wider people and there are people who come in and volunteer and <coughs> are more loosely affiliated with the group and, and come in, maybe they're coming to a meeting or an event or kind of indirectly engaged and then you've got the wider community that you're reaching out to. But it's a core group of people that you're working with really who are, who are your active uh, engaged members and 
so that the, uh, the feeding tariff from the government to lose all tariff flexibility to the feeding tariff. And that would be big energy companies are perhaps going to grow, um, become unwilling to pay, pay out money to, um, to local communities when their, their concern perhaps is more the, the, the great expense in, 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 in running the grid, which they're not mm. necessarily going to get any income from. They're paying out from their, they've got you know, huge. Um, uh, that, 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 that those economic costs to, to bear in mind. Okay, I'll, I'll address the first one. Um, yes, we are involved with, with Hackney Energy. Um, one of the chair or co-founders of Hackney, the community group called Hackney Energy, um, where one of the co-founders was in, and she was inspired by our six million projects and she had come and attended those, uh, some of our events she wanted to set up something similar in, in Hackney. And, you know, we kind of supported her in that process and then and through that process, you know, she got more people involved, um, you know, within Hackney, really. So it's kind of, in a way, you know, Brixton and Energy inspired Hackney Energy and, and some of the, the people who were involved in, involved in it. And, and we had also started discussion with, uh, with Hackney Council. So taking the similar approach where we worked, worked with Lambeth Council in, uh, in Brixton, Hackney Council were quite really kind of supported and involved there and, and you know they felt like this is something that they wanted to, to do. So free hiring is in a formal kind of contractual agreement with Hackney Council and um, who's been supporting Hackney Energy um, to uh, to kind of run a project in Hackney. And uh, we're working on an essay set called Balancer House and that's just been recently uh, announced. Um, and we were, you know, kind of working on the estate, talking to residents, getting involved. Um, the, the cooperative is yet to be kind of uh, registered. I mean, it's going to be registered in the next couple of weeks, but we've got local local people as directors of that cooperative, uh, and we're kind of supporting, we find and supporting them in, in, in taking the project to start to finish. And, uh, so I think we would see uh, a project launch maybe early July or something, in terms of share offer. Is Hackney Energy the name of the cooperative? No, the cooperative is because the project from Bannister House, so the Bannister House, but from the cooperative. So it's it's about you know the local the local name and brand is really important because that's what people want to invest in in such schemes. The other issue about the feeding tariff. The other issue about the feeding tariff. Yes, I mean. It's a, you know, while, while it was best that it's also on the other hand, it's, it's a challenge and what happens, you know, the feeding charity is constantly being kind of, it's, it's on a regression really, so it's constantly reducing. On the, uh, on the other hand, we found that the, the cost of solar panels have also reduced, so in, initially when uh, we paid a lot more for our solar panels and now that that's kind of, so it is balancing out. But I think in terms of making our financial model more robust, where we're not totally dependent on feed and tariff, it's about being able to supply that energy directly to residents. And, th and that's a way of kind of unlocking that dependency on feed and tariff. And, you know, if the models are built where we can supply that energy directly to residents, then you're shifting away from the feed and tariff. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, our solar panels are plugged into communal supplies. So we're powering this community spaces, offices, and it's still, it's still a lot less. Whereas we want to be able to move to a place where we're able to provide it, being community on renewable energy directly to residents living on those blocks, really. And that's a more independent and resilient model. But there's quite a lot to, uh, to kind of unpack and what that means and the regulations and policies to make that happen. So I'm going to take the question of the back. I just want to ask you about, so you say that the, the return to shareholders three to five percent. How much of money at the moment do you hope to put into energy reduction, energy, um, you know, and to uh, any, yeah, energy well, reduction? Yes, right. yeah. Well, our first couple of projects are really small, um, so they're like 37 kilowatts to 50 kilowatts, which, which are small projects, and you know, generating something like 600 to 1,000 pounds per year. Right. Um, and those are small funds to, to start with, but never, nevertheless, you know, on, an, on a local essay, that's quite a lot of money in terms of uh, value that you can get out of it. We also, uh, as I mentioned, we sold our carbon credits and what generated a bit more larger pots of money, um, which is ploughed back into the community fund. But where we're going to have projects where we're, we're going above 100 kilowatts, you generate more income for, for the local community. Uh, and, and to me, you know, having, having a local uh, 
cooperative, you know, and, you know, a group of people and organizations that the that you know these projects run for twenty years and they live for a long time in the community. It's a great mechanism to, to leverage more funding and to kind of tie into you're looking at energy first, but then people can get involved in other kinds of things like uh, maybe food growing or other things that are more relevant at that time really for the project. But it's all driven and decided by the members of the members of the cooperative and the local people. Um, maybe You just asked me the other day, I live in Hackney, so I just asked, oh gosh, is there a project like that in Hackney? Or I was talking about some community project. And I just laughed on the face of my, my response, was like, oh, as if, and here we are. So I think <laughs> it's brilliant, that's really good, and I want to find out more. Um, kind of in relation to the last two questions, it was about the financial model around mm. it. So you, obviously you're helping communities with their own cooperatives mm. um, save money mm. and... Uh, become independent and self, self, self yeah. sufficient with their energy mm -hmm. um, needs. Um, and then you guys as an organisation mm -hmm. have your own financial model yeah. which you have shareholders who have invested money in what you're doing. Is that right? Or um, I no, it's the, the corporates, the local corporates have their uh, investors and they get this fund of investment. So they just come in two for the one, for the two and three, our individual corporates. Right. We've had in London as an organisation uh, comes in we're a set of cooperative as well. Um, our members are the local co-ops and, uh, um, and community groups that we work with. Um, so our model is slightly different to uh, individual cooperatives. We get our funding as an organisation from um, government grant funds, you know, securing funds to local authorities, um, and you know, for the different models in which we look at getting our funding. So my question actually was around the issue of carbon credit that mm. is an area that has a lot of, uh, I'd say it's quite controversial mm. because of the whole carbon yeah. credit system just legitimising um, mm. people or organisations, companies, corporations yeah. who can buy carbon credits yeah. really are just using them to legitimise mm. um, the continued um, yeah. pollution and uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, so I, I was kind of curious to know how much of your financial model is dependent on that and actually whether it's something you would like to phase out or something that you're working on to build it? No, it's, uh, we're, we're not dependent on it on carbon credits. Uh, and I think what happened with our first two projects um, was because it, we were working on, a, on an essay that was already getting uh, a community energy saving program from the We were able to, to, to couple up and, and be able to take the benefits from selling our carbon credits to them. But we're not, as we can't imagine, we're not depending on, on, on that kind of, you know, as a, that was a one off really, and it's not what we're looking at in terms of future forecasting. Um, but there are other mechanisms that, you know, that would, might, could come in place, which would be under Section 106 or uh, Community Infrastructure Levy, which, which is about where new developers might be able to meet their. Um, their carbon reduction commitment to, to producing or building pipe or whatever, they, mm. they are then penalised and they would have a bit of a fine. And that could be a, a source of income that could come in for local energy project, projects. So maybe something along those lines, but less around you know, direct carbon offsets. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to say that the next Saturday, I live in Lewisham, so. Yeah, we, you know, and we would love to be able to 
to work with more local authorities and um, you know with their with their property portfolio, which is massive in terms of housing stocks really. Because I'm, I'm sure we've got the local elections, you know, I'm, I'm doing a bit of lobbying on, on that front. Mm. But could you give me, I, I, I do remember, because I was involved in Transition Harrying Day, and there was a group of people that lived in Maple Hill that said, oh, we want to set up our own mm. energy co-op. This was about three or four years ago. So they went off and did it. But then I, I sort of forgot all about it. And, um, mm. Mm. Well, yes, sir. Because yeah. for me, I, uh, I live in Lewisham, because I'm in Sizzle, but then actually I, I think I still vote in Harringay. <laughs> I think, you know, it's, it's definitely a movement, uh, to be honest, you know, it's, it's such a scheme does not exist in London, we developed it in, in Lambeth, and at that time, Lambeth is still kind of, now it is a cooperative council, which means it's about putting citizens at the heart of any kind of service delivery, and I was, because I was working within Lambeth Council, we helped with the, with the design development and taking the concepts really uh, and, and making it happen. So I think that would be quite way ahead in terms of what it's, what it's done. It's kind of been quite pioneering. Um, and we're hoping that the, with the government launching the scheme the energy strategy, um, when did that one get launched? I think earlier this year in Jan. Um, you know, the other local authorities would come on board and, and, and do a lot more. But it's still very much, uh, I, I think, you know, we, we can't entirely depend on local authority there, there are other kind of, you know, there's housing associations, RSLs, and other opportunities as well to be able to tap into uh, with um, assets, really, and, and look at other technologies, and we're quite keen to, to develop deep, yeah, you know, deep, yeah, not necessarily air source, deep, deep yeah, power, but, you know, oh, but looking, looking at a different, you know, because ener- electricity and solar kind of addresses the electricity, electrical kind of supply, but it's about heating, um, and that's where a lot of uh, residents pay a lot more. more I, I think uh, with, with ground source, you do need to have ground. So, I mean, yes, yeah, I'm sure there are loads of estates with, which have got, you know, open land where you can actually stick, you need to stick the pipe, mm-hmm. pipe, pipes in. Mm-hmm. And, and they do generate, uh, for every kilowatt of energy you put in, they get two or three kilowatts of heat. Mm-hmm. So they are very um, low carbon. And especially if the source energy is, is space solar, you can have a solar system which should be powering a ground source heat pump, mm. which should be, you know, very, very low carbon system. Well, mm. I mean... There's a lot of other technologies <laughs> out there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Environmental officer, 
would be the place to start, really. And, and um, given that you know we've already done it and, and we've got partnerships with a couple of local authorities, I think that's kind of starting point to say that look, it's already been tested, tried, and developed, um, and local authorities are getting on board. So uh, you know, I, I think while some of the local authorities are pioneering and uh, you know wanted things are willing to take the risk to take things off the ground. Mm -hmm. Others are more like, oh, who else has done it? What's out there? And they want to understand that convenience. Okay, that's already happened. It's a good starting point. Um, and as the, you know, we, uh, as you know, we've, we've got quite a lot of expertise in kind of working uh, with local authorities as each of So, you know, it's just kind of knowing how it works, its governance structure, and, and how to kind of tailor your message and sort of provide proposals. Um, it's really about linking in with their, their vision and their strategic goals and objectives, really. Uh, and at the moment, we're pursuing a policy strategy, and you know, a lot of local authorities have that uh, as a key area to kind of tap into, um, and, and really national policy as well. Um, you talked about organising events for local community. Would you organise an event for a local council to kind of show them the objectives and mm. show them the PowerPoint, talk them through the issues, and kind of get them on board? We we have been we haven't organised events, but what with the local authorities that we're working with, we have like several kind of meetings, uh, and the meetings is about bringing different uh, departments together. Because as I said, these these projects are so kind of they're they're, they're kind of integrate several different departments: be it housing, finance, legal, procurement, you know, and sustainability team. They all might be sitting in different different parts of the uh, of the organisation. So what we have done is kind of bring bring the right people together um, at, in in the meeting. But I think uh, we have you know as recurring, we we have thought about kind of let's get a couple of lo local authorities together and and, and and engage with them together and, and unpack what it would look like. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something that we would consider doing. Mm. So, um, I'm gonna yeah, no, actually, um, questions about potentially considering re retracting one question. So it's been in Hackney, is that the first project in Hackney that, yes. that you know of? Or that, that, it that is the, the first, yeah, 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 the first, first one. one. And, and presumably you would have had to engage with the council yeah. around that. Yeah. So presumably that's now laid the groundwork for mm -hmm. the city. Mm -hmm. Just remind us about that in Hackney, there is so much uh, residential development mm -hmm. that's going on. I was wondering whether another strand of mm -hmm. the work potentially be like getting into those projects before they're like um, talking to the council about those projects and the planning that's approved for those at the development stage, the development stage yeah. to make them all self sustainable yeah. development. Absolutely. I mean even with Lambert it took us um, you know a lot of our first couple of projects were pilots. Um, and when we said when we started having the discussion around let's look at your port property portfolio in a strategic way so you've got scaffolding going up, you've got roof works happening, let's look at making end results and at the same time, you know, bring it to the best economies of scale. Um, it took a while for them to um, you know, to then understand what would that look like and you know, to take anything on a more large scale kind of level, local authorities are tied by their kind of procurement frameworks and regulations. And we're actually in discussion with Landers right now in terms of what kind of models would be possible in communities and how you communicate to each team for the coronavirus and uh, doing some attendance models that we need to understand what that looks like. So um, it's going to take a little while to, to kind of look at the government structures um, and, and see how you can have such a team on a borough wide level. And happening are very much kind of, you know, this is a demonstration project, let's see how it goes. If that's best of it, well then we, we can look at things on a more kind of, you know, borough wide strategic level. But yeah, those, those discussions are happening. Um, have you thought about extending this sort of program beyond public and social housing to, for example, um, I think I worked in the university and I was really trying for a long time to persuade the mm. um, university to um, adopt um, you know, uh, carbon reduction measures and they're already introducing some. But I can see in terms of the, the training and skills aspects mm. which are um, a great way of Very large you know, universities often have a very key role when it comes to the community 
very healthy place. Yeah, I, I think you would love to. I think it's just a matter of us finding the resources <laughs> and, uh, and, and teams to, to progress um, such discussions. So, we, you know, as well as so far, our clients have had largely a local authority, mm -hmm. so we definitely would like to take that beyond the local authority. And you could do hospitals as well. Hospitals, yes, is a potential yeah, so there is a, you know, and um, to be fair, you know, in terms of as an organisation, we have a team of uh, of nine, but in terms of day to day, we have two people who who, who work on a day to day basis, and um, you know, it's been it's, we're quite a small mission organisation, but because this area is, is in development and it's a really niche market, um, it's it's really about kind of going from delivering projects and being successful and then to kind of scaling. And we're at that point where we're really getting a lot of interest and support and, and how do we then as an organisation take that from being small scale to, to larger supporting areas. We would love to get more people on board <laughs> and something. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Okay, guys. I uh, shall see you later. Um, I think the next one is um, what time is it now? Four o'clock. Ooh, I think I'm gonna have a free one. <laughs> Back soon.